начал лайв за засудокас 51.7 FM. The podcast will be talking discuss obscure video games that not many people know about. Special games made by Grasshopa Manufatch. Hello everyone. Let me introduce the people who are talking today. I'm Waru. Here today we are with Taito and Deep. We're gonna talk today about how we got into Suda and I want you guys to go first. And what Suda games have you played before? Everything out, just talk. You have ready Suda Cast 51.7 FM. Mm, how I got into Suda? Uh, first thing I remember, I played the demo of No More Heroes Heroes Paradise on my PlayStation. Then I bought the game, I finished it maybe once, uh, and for today's day I beat the game about 12 times or so. Holy shit. I saw this was so awesome and epic, it's crazy game to start up with. And this one last battle vs Henry and the Henning, oh man, just can't finish game even more awesome than this. Even though they did the second game, which I personally don't even consider to be sequel. Yeah, I like to think that Travis and Henry fought to the death in that one last battle. After that I jumped on Suda Train and gone wild. Since then I've played and beat every game that Grasshoppers made, excluding Contact and Zero Four. Zero Four is a very expensive Wii game. Hmm. Well, I've played No More Heroes for... It's been a long long time since I finished both games on Wii. And these two were actually my first Suda games also. First heard about them, uh, I think it was on Facebook, someone was recommending Wii games and someone said Mad World, if you liked Mad World, which I did, I played a bit of Mad World and I thought it was like really cool. The person was saying, if you liked Mad World, then you will like No More Heroes too. And then I checked it out and it was awesome. I also don't know how exactly the No More Heroes 2 ended. I don't know actually what to think about Henry at all. I don't remember him very well, I just remembered his Travis brother. Yeah, Henry is twin brother of Travis and uh, husband of Silver Crystal. Yes, yes. Oh boy, spoilers for Taito. <laughs> I didn't like the second that much, I liked the first one um, better, it was really really better in all the ways, especially the part of the map, which they just cut off the, the whole open world thing, as I said in the previous podcast, and I thought this was very lame, but to compensate that the gameplay got better in many ways. But the game is as short as the first, I think. That's basically it for me. When I finished No More Heroes, I spent like one year waiting to discover another games, another awesome games. And then I found Flowers in the Rain and Killer7 and uh, the story goes. How about you, Taito? Oh well, I'm a relatively new fan of Suda. And I got into it because of you. You, you should remember, you made me play uh, Flower, Sun and Rain, after I told you I wanted to play Killer7. Mm, yes. I was actually looking forward to playing Killer7 for quite some time, for some years. But I only got to play it like very little time ago because you needed me your best to, to do it. Then I played Killer7, I played uh, Flower, Sun and Rain, I played some other games since then. I've played like uh, I played some Killers Dead just for a uh, quick while. Uh, I've tried to start Michigan Martinons. I always had some problem while playing it. Have Martin. you played Cinemora? I've begun it again recently. Yes, I've played Cinemora. It's a good game, good shooter. I thought you would like it better uh, because uh, you're very fond of Toho. Serious. It was actually kind of easy to play. Uh, Cinemora was kind of... It got better to the, uh, towards the end, but it was mostly uh, um, somewhat easy shooter. It has good patterns, a nice difficulty. And it's also important to know that the uh, game was uh, mostly made by Hungarian company Digital Reality. Grasshoppers wasn't involved as much as like maybe previous games. 
Yeah, but it, it is what's fun about the game. It looks very different. As far as I remember, the soundtrack was very good. Also. Yes, the soundtrack is very good. The history is very good. The gameplay is just fine. Uh, and, the, and everything actually feels quite soothing in the game. It's like you don't actually think that it's not something that Suda wouldn't try to do. I haven't tried it yet. Actually, I, I had just a few hours spent on Cinemura itself because I'm not really a big fan of shooters. Very few shooters quite, uh, catch my attention. The only shooter I really, really, really liked was Gunnet for the NES. And it's very cute. It has bunnies. Yeah, Taito, actually, I remember you, you said to me that a friend of yours uh, recommended Killer7 for you a, a long time ago. Yes, and I kept, like, uh, I, I was flirting with it for quite some years because I didn't have a PS2, so I had no way to play it. I only got to play it when you showed me your, your copy. And nowadays I play it on the emulator Dolphin, the GameCube version. Yes, let's talk a bit more of Larson and Rain. The first episode we talked about the game in general, but this time I, I want to focus on the characters and your favorite chapters of the game. Larson and Rain. I really like the immersion of the game. First you don't feel it, but then whoop, you're in for a ride. Especially when Shoutaro kid, the one with the football ball, starts to break game apart. It's, it's very funny considering time and place. And you just don't expect that kind of stuff. And uh, what about pink crocodile named Christina? Like the fuck? Even for Suda game it seems out of place. I don't recall any talking animals in previous games, so it's all quite surprising at first. And wonders just keep on coming. I don't know, probably the best character for in the game for me will be like Edo McAllister for quite some time. <laughs> I actually used Edo Mac for some time on, two, on, on while I was talking on Nirk. I spent some time. Yeah, yeah, we had an IRC channel called Lost Pass in which I was Sumio R and he was Edo Mac. Yes. We kind of role-played the characters there, but it, it I think it doesn't exist anymore. No, it, it does, but it doesn't have a RPs or anything like this. It's just destroyed. Oh, we need to revive that channel soon. Maybe someday. So, keep talking. <laughs> Actually, I don't quite have a, a favorite chapter. I think, but... Uh, but the times where you will get to walk at night like you're walking a dream and you get to see the crocodiles in your way and blocking the paths and the sun in the moon it quite got like an hammered down my memory when Sumi encounters these big uh, crocodiles it's so strange it's like Come on, it's sitting on the road, can you go near it or what? It's like in Genesis games when cats and dogs sitting on the staircase and you can't go up. <laughs> Come on! It's one pink crocodile running in cycles. It, it's probably not even interesting you. I don't remember uh, Sumio ever meeting Christina in the game. Well, actually he doesn't. Yeah, that's that's why he was so afraid of crossing a crocodile's path. But crocodiles uh, can um, eat you. Chris will eat you. I've read that Christina's favorite meal is humans. <laughs> so that's kind of dangerous. Some meals. She eats some meals. She eats some meals. They're the be uh, yes for breakfast. There's a lot of them. Yeah. That makes sense. So she can show some of them. There is never a shortage of sumios. That's the best meal ever. <laughs> well, um, for me, uh, I think my favorite moments in Forest and Rain were when Sundance Shot appeared, and 
when Sumio was shot by Sundance shot. Shot by shot. You got to play as um, the two cops, Remy and... Uh, Yoshimitsu from Tekken series. Yeah, Yoshimitsu from Tekken. He has a sword. He does a, a spin attack if you uh, piss him off. Yoshimitsu also plays a big part in Soul Calibur series. Yeah, it's it's everything. It's very accurate because Farsen and Ren and Tekken are actually crossovers. That is a very weird part in the game because you you get to access the the Eliki Island. Yeah, Eliki Island. It's very weird there. And Remy just um, finds a copy of herself. It's a, a cloning facility, which Edo wants to destroy, I guess. And and that was when a few of the moments in the game when the story actually got serious. But I also appreciate the funny part so much. Just like you you said, the the Shotaro uh, parts, they were uh, like one of the best for me. When, when he says, um, like, uh, why do, do there are portraits look like that? And why do our 3D models look like that? It, it hasn't anything to do with the 3D models at all. And I was laughing all the time. And when Stefan appeared, uh, um, a few times I had very much fun with him. Like the, the first time he appeared. Uh, it was actually fun, but at the end he got really um, irritating. Uh, he stole Sumio's car, um, gigs, right? And uh, man, I just wanted to kick him in the face, really. But actually, he's a very fun character. Stefan is a very annoying character. You just can't stand him at all. Uh, that's the point. He likes to be annoying. And that's why he's a, a good character at some times, in my opinion, of course. And of course, Sumio is my favorite because I identify a lot to him. He's uh, the basic uh, naive protagonist which wants to help everybody and doesn't know shit about anything. And he just runs in circles and runs across the island and I, I like that very much. I very much yes. appreciate that. I actually... Uh, I kind of like more the, the humorous aspect of Solarson and Rain after playing some other Xuba games. Just because he gets to take himself less seriously there. Even if that's some kind of personal aspect of him to not take the, his games too much seriously. But for sun and rain, like he said, it was like a, 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 a holiday. A, a, some time he got to do whatever he wanted just to get yeah. his mind off the silver case. And when you compare it to others, the games, you, you really get to realize that actually for sun and rain is a humorous game in, in his own Yeah, it's like um, in his own right. a day with... Um, bunch of characters who weren't supposed to exist <laughs> it's like the beach episode of Suda games mm, the, it's, it's the fun service the beach episode yes it's like just a spin-off but but it's it's my favorite game of all time if i i were to pick one yeah it's absolutely one of the best games that Suda made and it's funny because a lot of people hate it. <laughs> Game is not as cryptic as people think, but it forces the player to think differently in a way they don't think. You know, like, uh, you play action game, you shoot and run around, but uh, it's not it. You run around, but you don't shoot anybody. What you expect? It's a quest-adventure type game. You need to think through the game, not to shoot through the game. 
And I think that uh, where is a lot of people fail to understand. Yeah, and it has a lot of math puzzles. If you aren't good at math, then get out. Yes, but they're not that hard at all. I mean, you don't have to have PhD in math to be able to beat the game. It's not that cryptic, believe me. Uh, just be just if you want to to get all of the lost and found puzzles. Yeah, lost and found are very hard ones. Yeah, if you don't, you can just uh, play the the main story with no problems at all. It's very easy, actually. I've beaten the the PS2 games without any difficulty because of that. I wasn't bothered by any side puzzles. The only person that I showed Far Sun Rain 2, which liked it, was actually Taito. The other people uh, hated it or didn't even want to try to play it at all. Just like you said, Deep, they played like five minutes and then gave up. You have to, to keep explaining people, oh, oh, at the beginning you have to insert your, uh, your birth date. You have to use numbers only to solve puzzles, and everything is connected to numbers and blah blah blah, and people just can't figure uh, that out for themselves. It's, it's quite annoying. Also, people, what do you think about uh, the voices of characters in the game, how they talk? Like, you know, the gibberish talk. A fan of gibberish talk, like... Ever since The Sims, I think it was a, a, a great idea to do. I appreciate that Suda kept it uh, in Killer7. Especially it was Aru's voice, it's like... <laughs> well, one thing about Killer7, that's... It, it is gibberish talk, but... You hear actual words that are written. I heard that in Force and Rain is actually a bunch of mixed uh, languages with effects. Actually, all, all token of Force and Rain is just Japanese rumble, free speak, but uh, none Japanese people would never understand that. So we need to ask a few Japanese folks to tell us all about it. Yeah, for me, I couldn't actually hear any word at all. Not any Japanese word or any word that I, I remember knowing. So he actually only, only uses a gibberish talk for the English release of the game. In Japanese version the voices are very clear. They all in English, just like an English one, but they don't have any special effects added on it. They have like reverb and that's it. You can clearly hear everything they say. It's not like Travis say it's uh, very clear English, but uh, just like little echo around it. Oh, I, I can imagine Travis talking like that. Master. <laughs> and Travis is all like, I'm gonna kill you, you fucker. He actually talks just like this. <laughs> you got his voice very clear. Actually, knowing Suda and getting to play his games, had quite an influence on my life, just because, uh, you know, Suda is a, a, a graphic designer and I am a graphic designer too, so I can get to see the things he did in his, game, in his games. And That's very cool, because this way you can just um, reimagine stuff. I mean, uh, you, you can reinvent your whole style if you get if you get into something like Suda. Yes, well, uh, just because, uh, um, sorry, like I said, I am a graphic designer and Suda is a designer too. So most of these things got to, uh, got to influence my work and the things I, I see and I do. Like uh, the first game I played, Killer7, it has a very different aesthetic if you compare it to Florissant and Rain. Like, but you can see the influence of the same, the same, uh, uh, the same artists on both games. Like I was saying to you that they, that I think Hiroshi Nagai had a lot of influence over Suda. 
in the way he makes his buildings, his uh, uh, his scenarios, like the way he drew for Sun and Rain, and he got to think about the scenario. And I like how he got to do a much darker game like Killer Seven from this influence and uh, a super happy game like Flawless Sun and Rain. Because Flawless Sun and Rain is extremely happy in my own opinion. So he actually did that quite the actually had quite the influence on, on my own view of graphic design and it got me to know a lot of other artists that I didn't before. I was thinking, if you actually compare them both of the games uh, graphically, they're, they're very similar to each other. In Killer7, there was um, a lot of Capcom stuff going on, I think. Suda, Suda wasn't the only writer for the story of the game. Yeah, it was a very hard work for him. And um, have you seen the beta content for uh, Killer7? I mean, Sundance Shot originally was in the game. And I was like, what? When I saw it that the first time, I was, um, what if Suda produced the game uh, by himself uh, without Capcom and without any other people? In the middle. Would it be a Flowers in the Rain sequel? Would it be a Silver Case sequel of some sort? I don't know. I think he actually got. Uh, uh, I think he actually will have some freedom if he does uh, some kind of remake of the Killer 7 for the PC. He actually. Sh he's shown his interest to doing this. And. I think he'll probably do take his liberties to do some things they couldn't do the first time, just like he did to the silver case. But the silver case got like the oldest graphical overhaul. No, I don't think he would modify the story of the game. But I don't know he, if he will uh, like add anything to it. He could probably put more stuff in the game. But just like the silver case has parallel cases that you can visit besides the main. That's uh, I think Sudo would probably think of something to do. Yeah, but to like for instance include Sundance Shot again in the game if he wanted to, he wouldn't uh, uh, insert him in a remake. I think he would have to make a new, whole new game to add his original ideas from the beginning. Yeah, Killer9. It would be great. Do it, Suda. Please. Forget about No More Heroes and do Killer9 right now. I don't have some quiet influence in my life, not not a lot, but uh, a bit. Uh, once again, I wanna tell something about No More Heroes and how it's changed my perception of violent games. Before that, I didn't really care as much of what I was doing in my games, like killing people, destroying buildings, making chaos and destruction. It's all fun when you don't think too much about it, and you shouldn't really. There is an episode about Power Fantasy on a show called Extra Credits, which is a totally awesome show about video game design and such. But back to Nomo Heroes. To make long story short, in that Power Fantasy episode they are talking about having moral lesson and the consequences of things that you have done in the game. Having a cause to justify somehow something that you did. Like for example, you play in some violent game where you run around obliterating everything you see, killing everyone on the screen, and suddenly your mom comes by and asking, oh Sonny, what are you doing, what are you playing? And you answer something like, I am killing everybody on the planet. Like, you may ask, why, what for? Actually it's not that big of a deal, because we used to it now, It's and it's just a game, who cares? But things getting hyped up when the same dialogue happens inside our game. 
In no more heroes there is a battle on the beach against Holy Summers, cute disabled girl who lives through the horrors of war. She asks Travis about killing people and stuff, and he is like, she can meaning in everything is a bad habit among little girls these days. Because this is because this is what it is. Later in the game Travis acknowledged the fact that he is just another psychopath killing machine. Same thing happens in second game, but uh, forget about it. Like you know, in Postal. Postal actually has some nice motivations. You you got to get milk, so <laughs> Postal is a fun game. You get to do fun things like <laughs> yeah, collecting cats and putting them on your gun to use them as silencer. Just like I do in real life. That makes me realize that throughout the whole game I've been killing dozens of people without giving it too much thought. And then game just tell me, look at what you have done, are you happy now? Are you happy about it? But don't think too deep about it, because you shouldn't, since it's just a game, not a real life. Well, I don't know about you, but I've always been a big RPG, and whenever I get to play like an action game, or an open world, open world game, like for instance, uh, GTA, or uh, The Witcher, or Skyrim, or something, I always think about my actions, I always think about every action I take. I always try to not piss off anyone. I always try to uh, not causing any unnecessary trouble. I um, am very cautious overall because uh, Japanese RPGs influenced me uh, very much about that. They always um, like if you if you can't talk to NPCs, then just don't bother, you know, and. E the the games I've played that are my favorites, like uh, some games from the Shimegami Tensei series or Final Fantasy series, for instance. Uh, like you just follow things; it's very linear. You you don't have to do much. But if you had the chance to do things like that on a Shimegami Tensei or Final Fantasy game, like killing people, random people without any reason, I wouldn't do that. Because I think it's wrong. I I only I only think about this on like fighting games and like GTA because in GTA it's actually fun. But like for instance, there are bunnies in World of Warcraft and you can actually kill them. And I think that's kind of cool. It's like uh, in MMO RPGs, you you had you have like cute animals wandering around and you just can kill them for like. Nothing. It's unnecessary. Why would you disturb the peace of other people? Just do your mission. Do your job. I actually tend to do things that are not planned in the game just because I want to see if I can do it. Not exactly killing things or something like this. Like, uh, well, I tried this when I was very young, when I was playing Warcraft 3 and those things. Nowadays, I just like tend to see if it's possible to do something that wasn't planned. The Twin Peaks is basically the Silver Cave. You mean Deadly Premonition? Yes. Deadly Premonition is more like. Twin Peaks because it was uh, totally based on Twin Peaks, but um, the Silver Case just, just was a bit influenced by that. And I read, I read at the Paradise Hotel that someone compared uh, Moonlight Syndrome to uh, Blue Velvet, and I was like, well, uh, that may be uh, kind of exaggerated, but if you think about that a bit. Uh, it's like kind of similar because in Moonlight Syndrome you are a person investigating a thing you you shouldn't like do that but you do it anyway just like in um, Blue Velvet uh, you you meddle on someone's problems without being asked and this is what you get trouble and 
you see a lot of things that don't make any sense at all in both Moonlight Syndrome and Blue Velvet. Like, in Blue Velvet, there is uh, that guy that has the mask, which is Dennis Hopper, represented by Dennis Hopper, I mean, or he, he breathes in the mask and says, come to daddy or something, or... And in Moonlight Syndrome, you see uh, people who are totally crazy, just like that. Just, uh, not in the same way, but they are totally crazy, and you, you're not sure about what you see there. And there's a lot of um, questions you have to make. That's why I like to think of, of Suda as a lynch of video games. And a lot of people do that, because they, they see a lot of similarities um, between um, both... Uh, styles of making stories. People tend to compare Suda to Tarantino a lot. Yes, they're just um, abstract artists. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, uh, like uh, No More Heroes and Killer is that um, I quite like Tarantino films, movies, as some people say. Uh, not fully influenced by that because I've watched uh, like uh, almost all of the, the Quentin Tarantino movies and I haven't seen uh, much similarities uh, just um, a weird uh, way of telling the story like not a linear story but a story that um, like in, in the beginning of the movie you're actually seeing the, the ending of the movie and stuff like that and very violent stuff and I don't think that was a real influence on Suda but it, it's kind of like similar I, I think Suda actually uh, didn't focus on, on getting that influence from Tarantino because he uh, I think he figured out by himself that violence in video games is a normal thing and he did it his way and for me, I actually wanted, I wanted to play No More Heroes because Suda said that El Topo is a major influence in the game. But, but I, I still have to play the game so I can say something about this. Yeah, but um, how many times have you seen similar stuff in video games? Well, very easy. No More Heroes is just Kill Bill Volume 1. Yeah. And that uh, El Topo movie. That's why I say... I haven't seen El Topo. Uh, it seems like uh, No More Heroes was influenced by El Topo. And I'm always interested in crazy directors and huh. things like that. But it's like, uh, uh, if crazy I... Crazy movies. I don't know. I haven't played No More Heroes yet, so... I can't say... Uh, I don't have much of a say on the matter, but... At least from my point of view of someone who sees what the game is about and I think it looks more like an El Topo game than a Kill Bill movie game. I think the thing that Suda mostly likes, probably likes about uh, uh, Kill Bill and other Tarantino movies is probably the unholy quantity of blood and everything, the violence, the gratuitous violence. But as I asked Deep a few moments ago, how many times do you see that in video games? Just, uh, it's the same thing. Absurd amounts um, of blood? Yeah, absurd amounts of blood. It's uh, just normal. Yeah, you see it every day in uh, almost every game that it's created. But so the boys look like it. You know, the holy amounts of blood. It's like uh, 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 some characteristics of of his games are that you can always see that he does not hold himself back when he portrays blood. And but I, I think it's not a direct influence by Tarantino. I just I don't think so too. That's why I don't know if I can say that. Uh, that's so much of influence from Kill Bill than the small token. Also, in Kill Bill, uh, uh, the character Mutruman represents, I forgot her name, sorry. Uh, she has a reason for doing that because literally she wants to kill Bill. 
But uh, just like uh, Tarantino movies and Kill Bill and things like this, we got, got to reference a lot of pop art and things like this. Yes. Uh, it's actually his trademark. Yes. Pop art. So it's easy to see a connection between Tarantino movies, especially Kill Bill and Suda games. Yes, it's very easy, but I... Uh... As I'm, I'm saying, I don't, I don't think it's a direct influence. It's just more like similarities, really. If there was a, a direct influence, I, I would say it was either David Lynch or Alejandro jo Horo uh, Horodovsky. <laughs> All right, this is what Sudokas 51.7 FM. Thank you for riding with us today. And good luck. See you next time. Thank you for watching or hearing the podcast. Master. <laughs> yes. In the, the name, name of Karma, we're in a tight spot. See you next time, Master. See you next time. This is Sudokas 51.7 FM.